This is the most iconic image of Dartmouth's campus. Pretty much the first thing you notice when you get here, with hourly songs ringing throughout the campus. It's also one of the oldest, with the tower being established in 1928. It actually kind of reminds me of the clock tower from the movie Back to the Future. In the movie, Marty travels back in time 30 years into the past and ends up finally interacting with his parents in their teens. And in, in these interactions, he actually ends up saving his own father from a speeding car. But what if Marty didn't save his father? What if instead Marty's interference somehow led to his own father's death somehow? This is very similar to the grandfather paradox. The grandfather paradox is a time travel narrative in which the time traveler goes back in time and kills their own grandfather before he's able to have their father. Since the time traveler's grandfather is killed before he's able to have their father, then the time traveler is never born. And if the time traveler is never born, then how could the time traveler go back in time in the first place? This is where the paradox arises. How do you prevent your own birth? The simple answer is, you can't. This paradox is pretty old and has been discussed and debated pretty extensively in the academic community. And there are many ways of looking at this paradox, but one way of looking at the grandfather paradox is from a physics perspective. From this perspective, we have to look at the grandfather paradox from a timeline perspective, or how the timeline should follow by a specific model of physics. Under this theory, when the time traveler traveled back in time to kill his grandfather, a new timeline is produced. For lack of better words, a new world. Under the branching space-time theory, generally the split in the timeline is formed at the point where the time traveler travels to. But let's look at this for a second. There are two obvious issues here. The first issue lies in where we define the point of divergence. If we define the point of divergence to be where the time traveler arrives in the past, it's clear that he would just continue forward through the original timeline. So what we have to do is make sure the time traveler lands on the alternate timeline. But if the traveler merely lands on some arbitrary alternate timeline, then what exactly is the point of the divergence defined there? What if the time traveler went further back in time? Will the point of divergence still be there? Because then they'd still just continue forward on the original timeline. This creates an issue of infinite regression, where no matter how far back you go, the point of divergence can always be just regressed further and further back. To the point of being infinitely regressed and forming two completely separate timelines entirely, but maybe you could argue that that was the original intention. Two completely separate realities where the time traveler could just hop in between and affect with their decisions, you know, differently. But if that's true, it's really no longer a time travel story now, is it? It's a dimension hopping story, right? I guess. Additionally, as said by Henry Reich, the creator of the channel Minute Physics with a master's degree in theoretical physics, this solution is just kind of boring because it just avoids the paradox. But Admittedly, Reich's own solution to the paradox isn't that much more satisfying. Similar to the branching space-time solution, the solution that Reich proposes only creates more issues due to its nature. The solution Reich proposes creates a closed time-like curve. Originally, the series of events went as follows. The time traveler goes back in time to kill their grandfather before he has their father. Then, because their father is never born, neither are they. If they're never born, then they cannot go back in time to kill their grandfather in the first place. So, is the paradox. However, Reich's solution is to simply just continue the sequence of events. So, they're never born able to go back in time to kill their grandfather, then the grandfather isn't killed, and he is able to have their father, and therefore they are alive to be able to go back in time and kill their grandfather. While this is a bit more satisfying on the surface level than branching space-time theory, or at least to me it is, there's an issue with the solution too. If we think about a timeline, all it essentially is is one elongated chain of cause and effects, in that each event is causable and that precedes it. This is not fatalism, by the way, the idea that all events are predetermined by events that precede them. Because under fatalism, you can argue some pretty bizarre things, like the signing of the Declaration of Independence, which was roughly 250 years ago, is not temporally compossible with my head being shaved today. Well, yeah, that is true, it's also like a useless fact. David Lewis actually talks about this in his paper, The Paradox of Time Travel, which we'll talk about later. For now, all we need to know is that with cause and effect, I only mean to say that an event is caused by the one that directly precedes it. And under this idea, the concept of a closed timeline curve is paradoxical within itself because it doesn't respect the idea of causality. Because if this series of events that the time traveler follows is indeed a closed loop, then the causality is all messed up. Events are caused by those who precede them, but because it's a loop, you could very well argue that the time traveler's birth caused their father's death. But his death is supposed to be an event that's after their birth. You can even argue that their birth causes their own birth, which is definitely pretty wonky too. 
It is important to note, however, that Wright does say that the solution isn't exactly consistent. He just doesn't exactly go into the rationale as to why it's illogically consistent. We mentioned David Lewis's paper, The Paradoxes of Time Travel, in which instead of taking a physics-based approach, he actually takes a philosophical one instead. But before we dive into that, first we have to sort of understand the essence of the grandfather paradox itself. If we look at the paradox as we did earlier in what is called standard form of philosophy, we can actually see Lewis's claim very clearly. Looking at the board, we can see the premises are as follows. If time travel were possible, one could prevent their own birth. However, one cannot prevent their own birth, and therefore, time travel is not possible. And in essence, this is what the grandfather paradox claims. Lewis, however, doesn't aim to disprove a single premise, but instead claims that not only is each premise 100% true, but that there's also no contradiction at all between either of the premises. But how can this be? How can I say that someone both can and cannot do something? If I were to tell you that I can speak Finnish, and then tell you that I cannot speak Finnish, you'd probably look at me really confused. Lewis, however, maintains that this dichotomy naturally exists between a lot of modal descriptions. In his paper, he says that any human can, in fact, speak Finnish, that we are physically capable of making the sounds that are part of the Finnish language. You, me, Lewis, or any human for that matter, is physically capable of speaking the Finnish language. In a sense, any of us can speak the Finnish language. However, Lewis also says that he cannot speak the language. He says that his speaking Finnish is impossible with the set of facts included so far, but not further facts about his lack of training. This set of facts we've already mentioned, what he calls the narrow delineation of facts, supports the idea that he can in fact speak Finnish. However, according to the wide delineation of facts, his lack of training in speaking the language means that he cannot speak the language. The confusion here comes from the tricky nature of the word can. It's dependent upon what you decide to be relevant facts for describing one's ability. And he set this as the basis for discussing the grandfather paradox. Just as a different delineation of relevant facts dictates one's ability to speak a foreign language, the same delineation is used in the grandfather paradox. It's worth noting that in Lewis's essay, he discovered the time traveler as being a very capable marksman with the best rifle money can buy, and at the peak of physical training. He describes the time traveler in this way to just to accentuate how there's no reason why the time traveler wouldn't be able to kill his grandfather. In fact, in this example, the time traveler is pretty much the most capable person of killing his grandfather. Lewis argues that the narrow delineation mentioned earlier supposes that the time traveler can kill his grandfather, as there's no reason as to why the expert marksman time traveler should not be able to. However, the wider delineation supposes that he cannot kill his grandfather because his grandfather simply was not killed and you can't change the past. Lewis says it even more simply that the conflict is essentially that the time traveler doesn't kill his grandfather, but can because he has what it physically takes, versus the time traveler doesn't and can't kill his grandfather because it's logically impossible to change the past. Both of these statements are true in the respective delineation of facts. However, Lewis says that you have to choose and commit to one of these options, one of these sets of facts, because it's a wavering between the two that creates the unsoundness of the grandfather paradox. If you commit to only one set of facts as a valid argument does, you'll find that time travel is possible, and that the innate contradiction the grandfather paradox presents is only a result of the misinterpretation of the word can. <sighs> Something feels off about this argument, doesn't it? I don't know, he's, he's saying that the time traveler is able to kill his own grandfather, and that he physically has the capability to do so, but they obviously can't kill their grandfather. No matter how many times they try to pull the trigger, no matter how many times they go back in time to do so, he will always fail. They have to, right? Kadri Villain actually explores this in her paper, What Time Travelers Cannot Do. Well, she agrees that the grandfather paradox is not a sound argument, like Lewis does. She argues this from a very different perspective. She actually pretty much directly refers to Lewis's argument and pretty much completely dismisses it, calling it the naive objection. Ouch. In her paper, she divides the argument into the perspective of the incompatibilist and the compatibilist, with each describing the perspective Lewis brought in his naive objection. She compares the viewpoints of the naive objection with determinism, a philosophical view which essentially states that all events are predetermined and that free will does exist. A scary thought, I know, but very pertinent to our discussion. For the sake of consistency for our time travel story, determinism kind of has to be true, because now we get things like the closed timeline curve, which you discussed earlier, or just inconsistent time travel narratives, which we don't want. So, if determinism is true, then according to the naive objection, either premise must disagree. 
The second premise describes the incompatibilist, where one cannot prevent their own birth, since one cannot change the past. While the first premise describes the compatibilist, where one can prevent their own birth by interrupting their own lineage, by killing their grandfather, or in the villain's paper, by killing your baby self. Favellan actually argues that this distinction between the incompatibilist and compatibilist isn't actually true at all. The incompatibilist sees can being dependent upon all the facts about laws and past history, but the compatibilist sees can being dependent upon a proper subset of these facts, facts about the person's abilities and opportunities. It's because of this that Favellan maintains that the compatibilist and incompatibilist are wrong about the interpretation of the grandfather paradox. Firstly, the incompatibilist argues that the time traveler can affirm their own birth because change of the past, or any event for that matter, is impossible, and therefore not a matter about their abilities and opportunity, but instead about all the facts about laws and past history. However, Vellant disagrees. She says in her essay that someone can do something in the relevant sense, only if it's true that if she tried to do it, she would or at least might succeed. And I agree that both the incompatibilist and compatibilist would agree with this. Favellan therefore believes that the incompatibilist view sees can as being dependent upon the child's abilities and opportunities. And so if they both agree on what can means, in any relevant sense, then they must have identical conclusions, right? But they clearly don't. The incompatibilist believes that the traveler does not have the ability and opportunity to prevent their own birth, while the compatibilist does. Vellan solves this issue by defining what it means to fail at something. And she claims that someone cannot do something if no matter how hard they try, or how many times she tried, they always fail to succeed. Well, clearly the incompatibilist and the compatibilist must agree to this definition of cannot if they agree to how we define can. Therefore, it's clear that both viewpoints must agree that time traveler can prevent their own birth because they would always fail to do so. This is to say that no matter how many times they try to attempt this, they must always fail since they have to be alive in the future to be able to go back in time in the first place. In summary, Vivellan says that Lewis's reasoning for why the time traveler has the ability to prevent their own birth is faulty. She says that since there's no chance for the time traveler succeeding, the time traveler cannot prevent their own birth. And since the incompatibilist and compatibilist both agree on what can means, not only do they both agree that the time traveler cannot prevent their own birth, and that they do not have the ability nor opportunity to do so, but that either viewpoint would maintain that the grapple of the paradox is therefore unsound. It's obviously unsound for different reasons from Lewis's argument. Instead of lacking parallel structure between premises, like Lewis proposes, Vellan says that the first premise is just blatantly false, since she maintains that it is impossible to prevent your own birth. Two very different arguments, but also two fairly persuasive arguments, but there's a very simple argument against both of them that Frank Arzina depicts in his paper, time travel double your fun. Sure. He says that time travel is likely impossible in our universe. He says this because of the strangeness that both Vellum and Lewis share among their arguments. In either argument, it is impossible to prevent your own birth for different reasons, but impossible nonetheless. And either of them say that it'd be due to what Lewis calls a commonplace reason. Maybe a noise distracts them last second. Maybe they miss. Maybe their nerves fail. Or maybe they just feel mercy for their target for some reason. It could be any of these examples that Lewis lists, and Vellum agrees that these are the only relevant examples worth talking about. Arnzinius says that these are bizarre and implausible constraints, almost conspiratorial against the time traveler. Like, the universe itself is stepping in to stop this one person from doing this one thing that pretty much would be inconsequential in the grand scheme of everything. Almost like the universe itself is the one that would be jamming their gun, or making them miss, or making them trip up banana peels because no matter how many times they attempt to prove their own birth, they must always fail. Even if they were to attempt an infinite number of times, even if they were to go in the future and come back to the past with only more intricate models and methods of killing their grandfather, even if they were to go 200 years in the future and come back with some super crazy grandpa killing laser, they must always fail. Ardenia says that this bizarreness, the fact that the universe itself is to be conspiring against this one person, is the reason why time travel is unlikely in our universe. Honestly, all these arguments are very persuasive, but also each hold their own problems and speculations, and that's kind of the issue with time travel. Speculation. As far as we know, time travel isn't impossible, at least according to our modern understanding of physics. But we also don't exactly know how to time travel, so we just kind of have to speculate and reason our way through some of these very tough and complicated problems. But hey, 
at least it lets us speculate fun things like murdering your ancestors and killing your baby selves.